message that I am going to try and share with you is outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. Hello and a very warm welcome back to the teaching series The Jesus That John Knew. We're kind of having a wander, a ramble perhaps, uh, through the 18th chapter of John as we follow with Jesus and the disciples as he makes his way towards the cross. And I want to pick back up from where we talked about last week when we saw the, 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 uh, this kind of lynching mob that arrived in, in the garden and there they are ready to, 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 to take Jesus away and there's a bit of a shocking storm. We had that nice uh, comedic scene where Jesus uh, reveals himself to them and this band of would-be lynchers kind of fall back and just overwhelmed by the glory of God. And, and now we see that in the middle of that, let me, let me pick up and read to you, um, in John chapter 18 uh, and verse uh, uh, 5, they answered him, we seek Jesus of Nazareth, and he said, I am he. Uh, and Jesus, who had betrayed him, was standing there with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked again, whom do you seek? And they said, uh, her Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered them, I am he. So if you seek me, let these go. This was to fulfill the word that was that he had spoken. Of those of whom you had given me, I have lost not one. Watch verse 10. Then Simon Peter, didn't you know it would have to be Simon Peter? Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Peter said, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that my father has given me? Well, again, you, you, we jump back into the story, and here we see the... If, if Jesus is the picture, I said to you last week that Jesus couldn't be intimidated because he accepts what is. What we see with Peter is this kind of well-intentioned non-acceptance. I mean, I kind of get it, but Peter's totally misread the situation. Peter sees the danger, he sees that around him the, the lynch mob has come, that Jesus seemingly is quite happy to go with them. So Peter thinks to himself, let me just, let me, let me deal with this. Uh, and he completely misreads the situation, and he completely misreads Jesus' uh, um, agenda, and he completely misrepresented the nature of the gospel. So, but, but Peter's, um, Peter's resistance, it, it, uh, Peter's non-acceptance, if you will, is born out of his resistance to what must be. Jesus' resilience is, is, is the difference because he knows what is. Peter doesn't. Peter thought he was serving God by saving Jesus from death. Can you imagine that? But Jesus knew he was serving Peter and all humanity by saving them in his death. And there is the, the, the thing of where religion just is like blows a fuse. Think about it. Peter thinks he is serving God by saving Jesus from death. But Jesus knew he was serving Peter and all of humanity, including Malchus, whose ear he just chopped off, by saving him in death. And, and see, notice... We told you, I mentioned this to you before. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken, that none of those whom you'd be given me had been lost. But Peter, he, 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 he hears that as the signal to move in the arm of the flesh. Oh, so he, oh, no one's going to be lost. Okay, we must move in. Jesus says, put your sword back into your sheath, Peter. What's wrong with you? Careful, listen carefully. Shall I not drink the cup my father has given me? Can we change the course of history? I was um, I, I, I was in, was was um, called into a, a, a um, attended a, a, a pastoral situation not so very long ago, where um, a friend passed away. And, um, or how we prayed. And I remember my confusion and my dilemma was all around how to pray in that situation. And I was confused because I had this, um, 
this sense that uh, maybe there was maybe the, 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 my, my prayer was anemic that I should have been able to call this person back from the death from their death I should have been able to save them from death I didn't realize I, I didn't realize to the extent that I should do that we're saved in death and here we've got here we've got Peter trying to change the course of history and he thinks that he can change the course of history by refusing to let Jesus die but Jesus knows that he can make history by accepting his death you see look and understand that because that's a profoundly important point uh, it's not refusal that will change history, it's acceptance. That's what happened here. In this case, understand that, in this case. And Paul, Peter's not attuned to that. Let's look, at, let's look at the account for a moment from Matthew's perspective. Matthew picks this story up in Matthew 26. Let me show you what he says. He says, while he was speaking, 26 verse 47, while he was, while he was still speaking, Judas came out of the twelve. Okay, Judas came, one of the twelve and came with a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one, the one that I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus said, friend, do what you've come to do. And they came and they laid hands on Jesus and seized him. The whole one of those who was with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should scripture be fulfilled? That it must be so. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out against a robber with your swords and your clubs to capture me? Day after day after day I stay in the temple teaching, you do not seize me. But all this has been taken place so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Can you hear that for a moment, please? The Jesus' rebuke. That's amazing. He doesn't rebuke. He doesn't rebuke Judas. He doesn't rebuke the the the, the, the lynch mob. He rebukes Peter. <laughs> he says to him, Peter, do you not think? that I can appeal to my father. He's saying, I can stop this any time I want. Peter, don't you get it? I can stop this any time I want. I can appeal to my father. Look at this. Dear God. And he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels. But how then should scripture be fulfilled? You see how Jesus, has, has, living as perfect man, understands the perfect plan? You see, well, this, this, this is what this means to live as Christ. You don't think I can stop this foolishness? You think I'm powerless in the middle of all these things that are happening to me? You think I reach into our, my life situations and things that trouble? We can't, we can't command the angels to come, but why do you understand? You have to have a, an insight, an inner insight, an inner knowing as to what is. Jesus knows the principle of, 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 of sowing and reaping. He knows, he's told them already, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Look, I can call for divine backup any time I want. But are we to be using the divine resource? to just avoid that which we don't like? Or what we learn to like, that which we're trying to avoid?
Hmm. But perhaps it's because Luke's a doctor. He, he, he treats his account slightly differently. Let's just have a quick look. Luke, Luke 22, and, and, and I'll show you how Luke, Luke says this, because it's, it's a very interesting part of this story. Luke 22, and um, where are we now? Um, yeah, verse 47 again. While he was speaking there, there came a crowd, and a man called, the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. And he drew up near Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And those who were around him saw what would follow, saw, saw what would follow. And they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. And then Jesus said to the chief priests of the officers of the temple of the guards who had come out against him, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you didn't lay your hands on me, but hmm, this is your hour and the power of darkness. And you see the, the different flavors you get by looking at the different accounts. Uh, Jesus in John, when John, the Jesus that John knows, is the one that simply wants to speak straight into into uh, into, into Peter in the way that he, in the way that he does. Um, I'll, I'll accept my cup, but look at the dimension that Luke gives you. Can you imagine in the midst of that? Think about that for a moment. Here's Jesus going to be he's, he's going to be taken off by this is a, this is a murder squad. This is a, these people are going to drag him away to crucify him. He's accepted that. Uh, he knows that he's, that he's dying for us and as us. So he's got, he's got that. Um, he understands that they are, he's, he's not angry with them. Look at Malchus. You see the thing about Malchus, there's no hatred or malice or fury in God. And, and of course not, because Malchus is living out of the ability. Of, uh, and Malchus is seeing life with the level of awareness that he has. And he, he Peter, a Christian, remember, the, the founder of the church, lops off the man's ear and the man's ear bleeding he must be writhing around in pain screaming and howling and you can just see about what's going to happen swords drawn everywhere uh, but then Jesus in the middle of that touches Malchus's ear <laughs> and the ear is restored but hold on they still take him to be crucified <laughs> what, what do you think that Malchus must be thinking to himself as they're walking, as they're, as they're leading Jesus back to, uh, to, 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 be, to be crucified, to, to face trial, Malchus has got a brand new ear. Now, I'll tell you something, I'm thinking that Malchus might have ears to hear at this point, aren't you? It, it's incredible. But the thing that is so amazing to me is that we, here, here are, are, are we as believers, fearful that God won't love us. Fearful that God will punish us. Striving to seek rewards from God. Fearful of, and keen to avoid punishment from God. And yet we see here that even in the midst of his own pending execution and the outrageous criminal injustice that's been done to Jesus, even in the midst of that, he has compassion for his enemies and may I add, restores the fortunes of his enemies. And I think this is really interesting because Jesus, if you will, an enemy of Christ is attacked by an ambassador of Christ and Jesus writes the wrong of the church. <laughs> it's just great. My. So even in the midst of all of that, Jesus has compassion for his enemies. What manner of love is this? Until next time, God bless you. Bye-bye. Everybody I know who really gets this message at a gut level has been to hell and back. I don't know anybody that really gets this that's not been in the slough of despond in the depths of hell. And it's only when you're down in the depths of hell that you can come to that, that grace moment. You see, grace isn't just some cute little theology. That's not what it is. Grace isn't for the strong.
don't think grace is for the strong. It's not even for the weak, because if you say you're weak, you're saying you've got some strength. Grace is for dead people. Grace is for people that have got nothing and nowhere else to go, who are finished, who are down and out, who are over. It's finished. And it's for people who are in the wilderness. You find grace, Jeremiah said, in the wilderness. That's where you find grace. When you're in the wilderness, in the midst of despair, and there's nowhere for you to go, that's when you hear the voice of grace. And this young man is in the wilderness. He's in despair. And the Bible says, and the famine came on him.